Virginia. So I'm Dory Fontaine, the Dean of Nursing here at UVA, and I'm just so very honored that we have Francine Netter with us today. And I wanted to just tell you a little brief background. Everybody loves the backstory. In fact, I think this is what we're going to hear about. But we have seven sponsors for this event, and the reason is because the Dean of Engineering is a good colleague of mine and casually mentioned a year ago, or last summer, that you know one of his um, former board members um, had a wife who you know, has a wife who wrote a book and it's about medicine and nursing and would I be interested? I was like, well, who is it? And he said, he said, and then it was Frank Netter, you know. And I was like, oh my gosh, would we be interested? So I wanted to just thank the sponsors of this event, and they are the UVA Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities out of the School of Medicine the Claude Moore Health Sciences Library, which has just gone above and beyond to plan an exhibit um, that you'll all see, the Eleanor Crowder Bajoring Center for Nursing Historical Inquiry, the UVA School of Engineering and Applied Science, yes, we even had Fred Epstein, head of biomedical engineering, who was on our committee, um, the History of the Health Science Lecture Series here at UVA, the Kinesiology Program in the Curry School of Education, and finally, of course, the UVA School of Nursing. So, you know, you find somebody wonderful to celebrate, and people come together. And I think that's the, that's the story about the University of Virginia. So, at the end of our panel, our presentation and panel, we have an incredible exhibit in the library. We are going to have a reception where we're going to be eating in the library. Um, in Frank's day, we probably didn't eat too much in libraries, but times have changed. So I want to introduce now um, Dr. Arlene Keeling. She's a centennial professor in the School of Nursing, and she has been directing our History Center for many, many years. And Arlene will be the moderator and introduce our panel. So again, we welcome all of you. Thank you so much for coming, especially our very, very special guest, Francine Bennett. Arlene. Thank you, Dory. It's a pleasure to be with you today and moderate this panel discussing Francine Netter's recent biography, Medicines of Michelangelo, The Life and Art of Frank H. Netter, MD. As Dory said, I'm Arlene Keeling. I direct the Center for Nursing Historical Inquiry at UVA. And um, we're involved in this fascinating history. I will be moderating our panel discussion after Ms. Netter's presentation and would like to take a few minutes to introduce our speaker, Mrs. Francine Netter Robertson, as well as the members of the panel. Francine Mary Netter is the daughter of Dr. Frank Netter. She grew up on Long Island, where her father had a large art studio in the family home. There, as, even as a child, she spent many hours with him while he crafted his meticulous illustrations and painted his magnificent pictures. Francine has a Bachelor of Arts from North Carolina State University, a Master of Art from Hofstra University, and an MBA from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She has written on the history of medicine for numerous publications, and now lives in North Carolina with her husband, Ralph Robertson, and their three children live nearby. Dr. Bobby Chabra is the Lillian T. Distinguished Professor of Medicine and Chair of Orthopedic Surgery as well as Professor of Plastic Surgery here at UVA. He specializes in hand and upper extremity surgery and no doubt has spent hours studying Frank Netter's illustrations. <laughs> Dr. Chabra completed his undergraduate work at Johns Hopkins University and received his MD from the University of Virginia. Among his numerous achievements, including NIH-funded research and textbooks, Dr. Chabra is nationally recognized orthopedic educator a fellow of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, and past president of the Virginia Orthopedic Society. We're going to look forward to his comments. Dr. Melanie McCullum is Associate Professor of Medical Education in the School of Medicine at UVA. She received her PhD in Biomedical Sciences from Kent State University and has spent the last 19 years teaching gross anatomy to pre-clerkship medical students. She has held positions in anatomy departments at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Mercer University in Macon, Ohio, Georgia, and has served as the Gross Anatomy Course Director at UVA since 2006. For medical and nursing students, interns, residents, attending physicians, and nursing faculty, Frank Netter's medical illustrations are well known. 
Indeed, Netter's exquisitely drawn diagrams depicting both normal anatomy and pathology have been used by generations interested in learning about the human body. As Dr. Matthew Borsinger noted in his review of Francine Netter's biography, quote, the delicate tracery of the superficial nervous system, the sweeping curves of the lobes of the liver, the bones of the skull color-coded in pastel blues, pinks, and greens. For many of us, the imagery of Dr. Frank Netter's Atlas of Human Anatomy is indelibly etched in our mind's eye. For his work, Netter has been labeled, quote, the greatest medical illustrator of the 20th century. In fact, the Saturday Evening Post called Dr. Netter, quote, the Michelangelo of medicine, a well-deserved monitor. Frank Netter joins a small cadre of famous physicians and anatomists of previous centuries, including the unparalleled Italian sculptor and painter, Michelangelo himself, and probably the most well-known, Andreas Vesalius, the 16th century Belgian physician who revolutionized the practice of medicine with illustrations based on his own dissections in De Humani Corporis Fabrica Libri Septum, that is, on the fabric of the human body in seven books. But as Vorsinger continues in his critique, quote, what do we know of the man whose gift it was to distill the most complex anatomic structures into vividly comprehensible illustration? Today, we will hear about that famous man from his daughter, Francine Meta Roberts. Medicine's Michelangelo provides us with a striking, in-detail account of her father's life. In it, Francine chronicles her father's youth, his medical student years at New York University, his residency at Bellevue, and the process whereby he came to work as an artist rather than a physician. She also documents the collaborating physicians and surgeons with whom he worked. In this first major biography of Frank Netter, his daughter captures his character and a glimpse of his personal life while simultaneously documenting his life's work. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ms. Francine Ness. Well, yes, they called him Medicine's Michelangelo. They called him the Dean of Medical Illustration. They called him the greatest medical illustrator. But I called him Daddy. <laughs> I used to spend many hours with him there. He had a studio in the family home. And I would spend many hours with him. Uh, I went there with, with some frequency. And we would talk about things that fathers and daughters talk about. And if he was teaching, you know, if he was making a picture of a, a heart, he would tell me about how that worked to circulate the blood. And if he was making a picture of a stomach, he'd tell me how that uh, worked in digestion. And um, it was really the pictures that told the story, and it was very easy for me as a young child to understand what was going on in these pictures. So today I'm going to show you some of his pictures and some pictures of him and tell you his story. So let's see, here we go. Frank Netter came from very humble beginnings. His parents had a stationery store in the theater district in New York. And ever since he was a small child, he went to the store and he would work in the store. All the kids in the family had to work in the store. And he would stack the magazines, and there he would see the Saturday Evening Post and with covers by some great artists. J.C. Leyendecker, with every December, would have a picture of a New Year's baby on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post. Or inside would be pictures of his um, wonderful advertisements, the Arrow Shirt Man. And, um, Norman Rockwell was just getting started with his uh, pictures on the covers of the Saturday Evening Post. And uh, Frank Nader would look at these pictures and say, oh, what wonderful lives these people must lead. I want to be an artist when I grow up. So he was always making pictures. He made this picture of his mother when he was 11 years old. She had been sitting there and peeling potatoes, and she had dozed off. And he went and got a pencil and drew this picture of her. And uh, he must have liked this picture because he kept it his whole life. He kept it framed and hanging in his studio. 
Then when he went to high school, he was he joined the um, the the staff of the yearbook staff as uh, the art uh, to do pictures for the yearbook, and he joined the um, art staff of the school student run publication, which was a magazine. And so he would illustrate the uh, uh, stories written by other students, or he would make the covers of the for the magazine. And I think you can see a little influence of Norman Rockwell's uh, work on this uh, picture. I call it the first pitch of the season. So he, um, he, when he was drawing um, in high school, he found out about a place called the National Academy of Design. And um, he is a very distinguished place where the academicians um, have a school and they teach um, students, art students. And it's very difficult to get in, but he took his portfolio there and they admitted him. He got a scholarship to go there. And he was studying art, and his mother found out he was studying art. And she said, no, art is a very nice thing, but it's no way for a young man to earn a living. You need to be a doctor, or a lawyer, or, or an engineer. But he made a deal with her. She would let him continue to study art if he would go to school, finish high school, and go to college. And when he got out of college, if he couldn't make a go of art, he would become a doctor. So he made that deal with her. And so he kept going to high school during the day and the National Academy at night and learning some wonderful things about art and how to make pictures. So um, he went then to the College of the City of New York after he finished high school. And this is a picture of uh, the quadrangle <coughs> that he made there. He made this and was it appeared in the yearbook his first year there. And um, it still looks pretty much like that today the quadrangle at City College. But after he finished his first year, he was an honor student um, there his first year, and he joined the track team, and he did things, you know, that college kids do. And um, still making all the pictures he possibly could. He um, had a job in the summer, and like kids do, and, and his mother was by then widowed, and she went into the hospital to have a hysterectomy. And it was a little, the surgery was not probably too different from what you might do today. The um, uh, anesthesia was terrible. There was no specialty in anesthesia. The surgeon administered the anesthesia, drew up anesthesia, and uh, maybe he had an assistant to help him. It was terrible. Patients would retch terribly afterwards, and um, there were no antibiotics. 1924, this was. No antibiotics, not for um, several decades more. And uh, she got an infection. And four days later, she died. Well, he cried, and he cried. For days, he cried. And he said, he, he said OK, that's it. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be an artist. I'm going to be a doctor, like she wanted. So that's when he decided he would go to medical school. And he finished his study at City College, and he went to the um, um, New York University College of Medicine, as it was then called. And um, it was tough. They gave him a box of bones, and they had to pay him, so they were out. So uh, Frank Netter found that he could best learn his subjects by making pictures. So he would go in the anatomy lab with, with his colored pencils. He would make pictures. And it wasn't long before his classmates said, could you make me some of those pictures so I can learn? And the professor started asking, could you make me some of those pictures so I can teach? So um, he did, and he was able to make a few dollars and sell some of his pictures, which was fine, because by then he had no parents. He was 19 years old. Well, he was, by then he was 23 years old. And um, so he made this picture. This is uh, a picture an oil painting he did of the East River, from, which is a view from where the school is. This is a beautiful uh, oil painting that hangs in our living room now. Then he interned at Bellevue Hospital. 
Bailey had its own ambulance service, and all the um, interns had to ride the ambulance. They no such thing as paramedics then in 1931. And um, so they saw a lot of different things. They would go into the tenements and deliver babies and things like that. Then when he finished two-year internship at Bellevue Hospital, he signed on the outpatient staff as a surgeon, um, an outpatient surgical staff at Mount Sinai Hospital, the premier Jewish hospital in New York. And um, he made a lot of friends there, some very distinguished uh, doctors that he uh, met there um, who were also just starting out. But at that time, he had a surgical practice and uh, with, a, with a more uh, a senior surgeon. And so, um, but it was now 1933. It was the depths of the depression. And nobody had any money to go to doctors. And if they did, they certainly wouldn't go to a young kid right after school. Um, and so he was selling his pictures. And the pharmaceutical companies found out he could make these pictures. And so they were coming to him with uh, money <laughs> and buying his pictures. And he, by then he had started a family already, he had children, and he was uh, uh, supporting his family by selling his pictures. Uh, they had some new drugs, and they would come to him asking for pictures to illustrate the function of these uh, drugs. And, um, but he felt very guilty about that. He said, no, he should really be concentrating on building up his surgery practice. So he decided that he was going to ask a ridiculous amount of money for the pictures, and the, the pharmaceutical reps, they would go away and not bother him anymore because the pictures would be too expensive. So he was getting about $50 a picture, which was pretty good money in the Depression. And, um, but he said, okay, he's going to ask $300 for a picture, and then they won't bother him anymore. So um, the next pharmaceutical rep that came in, advertising manager that came in wanted some pictures, wanted a series of five pictures. Well, he told the, the man, he said, well, I need $1,500 for these pictures. And oh, that's a lot of money, the man said. So he went away. But the next day, he called him up. He said, okay, I have permission. We will pay you $1,500 for each of the five pictures. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> it wasn't long before Frank never decided to resign from that assignment <laughs> and close his practice and devote himself full time to making anatomical pictures. Then in 1938, San Francisco, they had just finished um, building the Golden Gate Bridge and at the same time the Oakland Bay Bridge, these two feats of engineering. And they decided that they would have a big celebration, an exposition, they called it the Golden Gate Exposition. And they would have, it was something like a World's Fair. New York City had its New York World's Fair at that time, and they would have on the West Coast, they would have this Golden Gate Exposition uh, rivaling the World's Fair. So the Sharing Corporation came to Frank and said, could you make us an exhibition? Sharing was um, a leader in hormone preparations, in developing hormone preparations, and they wanted um, Frank to show off the, um, the, that and show the female hormones and how they worked. And Frank, and, but the one caveat was that it could only take 15 minutes to walk through this exhibit that Frank would make with his pictures. So Frank was saying, well, I can make them. certainly make pictures showing the hormone flows and the changes in the breast and so, changes in the uterus. But it, that would be a very interesting exhibit just to read about the functions of these hormones. But then he found out about a new product called plexiglass. And um, he said, I can make a sculpture of a woman out of plexiglass and project from underneath, project into her, put my pictures into her, and show the formal flows. And then I'll have a synchronized woman's voice telling what's happening inside of her body. And that, the sharing corporation, the sharing people, they love the idea. So he made this sculpture of this uh, seven foot tall woman and uh, had her pic the pictures of the changes in the breast, the changes in the uterus, the hormone flows, the uh, baby growing inside of her. If you saw her, you would actually believe there was a baby growing in her. And 
So she was, uh, she came out very beautiful. She had a baby every 15 minutes. <laughs> and, uh, she was very beautiful. She went to uh, uh, San Francisco and she was there for the full two years of the exhibit. And after that, she went to the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, where she continued to have babies for every 15 minutes to a very advanced age. <laughs> but uh, sometime after the 1980s, we lost track of her. We don't know where she is now. Then at about that same time, the Siba company, Siba Pharmaceutical Company, came to Frank Netter and said they had a new preparation, a digitalis preparation for the heart. And they wanted Frank to uh, make a little flyer. And it was a, a little flyer about this big and on the die cut in the shape of the heart. And on the front would be the picture of the front of the heart. And then the back would be the picture of the back of the base of the heart. And then open up the cross section of the heart. And so Frank made those um, four pictures. And they superimposed on that, they superimposed the text of the, the the writing about the, um, the, the digitalis preparation that they had, and um, the drug literature. Well, that was very popular. Siba sent that out to all the doctors in the land, and that was very popular. And they would, the doctors, some of them wrote back and said, we like those uh, little flyers that you sent us. Could you send some more, but without all that writing all over it? <laughs> so they did. They made the, a heart, and they put the writing off to the side. And then that was very popular. And then they decided that they would make um, pictures, that they would make flyers of the different, uh, for corresponding the different organs with the different drugs that they had targeting those organs. And those were very popular with the doctors. This is a portrait of my older siblings before I was born. He did this. This is an oil painting that he did at my brother house. Very pretty. Then came 1942, World War II, and he was young enough to be eligible for the draft, but he knew a pathologist who was uh, in charge of the, uh, uh, the museum, the, the, the medical museum for the Army, and uh, the Army Medical Museum, and he um, said, if you enlist in the Army, I'll get you assigned to the Medical Museum here. It was then on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. And uh, so that's what Frank did. He enlisted in the Army, and he reported to, uh, after basic training, he reported to duty on the National Mall and at the Army Medical Museum, and he had a beautiful studio on the top floor, but they didn't have anything for him to do. And he was, that kind of got him down because he really wanted to help his country. And, you know, it was a great lot of patriotism then. And um, um, he was kind of bored. He didn't know, he didn't have any assignment. But um, after a time, he got a phone call from General Weibel over at the Pentagon. And General Weibel said, Doc, uh, Captain Netter, they made him a captain, Captain Netter, I want you to come over here. I have a very important assignment, which I think you have unique qualifications to uh, help me with. So Frank went right, immediately went over to the Pentagon and met General Weibel, who was a very nice man. He took out a big book, General Weibel did, and threw it down on his desk and said, this is the Army's first aid manual. It has 20 different treatments for snake bite and six ways to split a broken arm, none of which is available in the field. I want you to redo this first aid manual, and, and, and um, we have eight classroom hours to train these boys before they go off into battle, and we need to train them how to take care of their wounds and those of their colleagues. Well, Frank knew immediately what he would do is he would make a booklet. And he made this little booklet, 100 pages, <coughs> and a little about that big, and it um, had a picture on one side and just a few bullet points on the other side explaining what to do that was illustrated in the picture. And that, the soldiers, they could remember that. In the heat of battle, they could remember. And uh, there were three principles. One was um, stop the bleeding, protect the wound, and prevent shock. And those were the three principles that he built this little booklet on. And I'm sure it saved a lot of lives. So. 
this was very popular. And they also had him do, uh, after this, they had him do more of these booklets was uh, survival booklets, survival in the tropics, survival, survival in the Arctic. And then they had him do, uh, they wanted to train the x-ray technicians. And they had two months to train x-ray technicians. And so they, he was, Frank was right now building up a staff to help him because he couldn't paint as many pictures. They couldn't paint that fast. And so he had, uh, they made a thousand pictures to go in his, his x-ray training manual and it would show how to position the patients, where to put the gun, how far away to put the gun, that type of thing. And it, that was very successful in training the x-ray technicians that they needed in those days very quickly. In two months they could train them. <laughs> Then there was a, a young uh, surgeon who was about the same age as Frank, and he was um, working there in the Surgeon General's office, and Frank met him. And this, uh, his name was Dr. Michael DeBakey. And DeBakey was already advocating for um, treatment of, bringing treatment forward to the, to the wounded in the field, and, and also advocating for treatment of the soldiers as they were coming home, the wounded as they were coming home. And Frank and Dr. DeBakey got together, and Dr. DeBakey lent his knowledge, and Frank made the pictures of how to treat these wounds of these soldiers, and Siva published these portfolios. And, and there was a series of about 12 portfolios, um, about 12 or 16 pictures in each portfolio. Um, not all wounds, but um, Siva published them and sent them out to all the doctors in the land. And they were so popular that at, after the war in 1947, Siva put these, um, portfolios together, took all the pictures that had been in these portfolios and put them together as a collection of pictures. And they called that the SEMA Collection of Medical Illustrations. And that they published in a big blue buckram book, a little thin book. And um, that was very popular. And SEMA could hardly keep that in print. In six months it went to a second printing. So that was very popular. And then that gave Siva the idea that they would make um, some, um, a series of portfolios, a series of um, periodicals, a periodical, publish a periodical called the Clinical Symposia, and they would have, they would invite some uh, doctors to write the text, but the main feature would be the Netter illustrations. And um, these were very popular. Siva sent them out, um, to all the doctors in the land, no charge, just sent them out as goodwill to all the doctors in the land. This picture um, is uh, one from a series of, uh, on the hand, uh, that a, a clinical symposia on um, surgery of the hand that um, Frank did with um, Ernest Lampy. It's really a masterpiece of a, of a clinical symposia, and um, that was reprinted over the years. That was reprinted many, many times and sent out. It was so popular. He did one um, with Frank Aid. Frank Aid was the psychiatrist and um, this um, on psychiatric diseases, and this is a man. He's depressed. But I think what's interesting about these portraits, these psychiatric portraits, and any of the portraits that he did was that this is not a picture of depression. This is a picture of a man suffering from depression. These are real people. He always said, these are not television sets we're repairing. These are living, breathing people. Then there was a young surgeon at um, Philadelphia Children's Hospital who um, was operating on newborn infants, which at the time was very esoteric. And um, he, these babies were born with uh, anatomical anomalies, which were, as he said, incompatible with life. His name was um, Dr. C. Everett Coop. And Frank found out about that he was doing this and asked him to do a clinical symposia. And so um, sometimes these babies would come in to, to, to Philadelphia Children's in the, in the middle of the night emergency. Sometimes um, they would 
know, Dr. Cook would know he's going to operate the next day, and he would call Frank up in New York and come down, and Frank would take the train down and see the surgery and see the babies. And then Dr. Coop wrote the text, and then he would go up to New York and go over the sketches that Frank had made uh, with the text, and they would go over that together. And that's how um, they made this um, clinical symposium. Went out to all the doctors in the land, and um, sure, it saved all these babies that had been born in these nurseries. Up until that point, it had been the babies would be just put in the corner of the nursery and left to die. And, um, but now they found out that they, these babies could be sent to uh, these special, specialty surgeons and be saved. And so that saved a lot of lives, I'm sure. This baby born with uh, the esophagus, the atrachia the tra the joint, or babies born without a rectum, babies born with the intestines up in the chest, and they could be saved. These pictures I've been showing you, this is, uh, these are some of um, a series of 12 pictures that he did at this, and um, called The Life of a Doctor. And um, this is a country night call. Um, he did these for armor, for the armor lamps, and they would use them to give out, you know, at the conventions and things like that, and they are very popular. Um, Frank gave the originals to New York University, his alma mater, and they are, they are quite cherished. Then, in 1953, Frank was, he was working for Armour, he was doing work with Pfizer and different pharmaceutical companies, as well as the Seba company. Seba got the idea that they would uh, underwrite Frank to do a series of atlases on the entire anatomy, pathology, histology, embryology, physiology of the human body. And, uh, they wanted to Frank to devote himself full time to that, not to paint for anyone else, and they would pay him extra to not to paint just exclusively for them. And so Frank signed a contract to work exclusively for SEBA. Now, uh, he estimated it would take him about 10 years to do these pictures, but the 10 years came and the 10 years went, and he had only scratched the surface of these atlases. And, uh, but he, ten, another 10 years came, another 10 years went, he signed another contract and another. Here's some pictures. This is um, um, the pharynx that he did. Looks something like Georgia O'Keeffe might have painted. <laughs> this is the schema of the liver, which he did with that great Dr. Um, Hans Pumper who wrote most of the text for that volume. This is a very well-known picture of a man having a heart attack. All the uh, precipitating factors of a heart attack are here. I don't know if you can see this. Let's see now. here. He's dropped his cigarette on the ground. Let's see what I'm saying. And he's carrying a, a heavy valise. He drops his valise. He's going, he just had a meal in a, in a restaurant, heavy meal, going out into the cold, in the snow, and, um, grabs his chest, he's in pain, and the pain is on his face too. But all the precipitating factors for a heart attack are here in this one picture. So how did he make these pictures? So he would take the sketch pad and he would sketch it out and, and with an ordinary pencil, number two pencil like that, we all have number two pencil, right? And um, sketch it out on the tracing paper and then he would take that, once he liked his sketch, he would take that sketch, and this is of a little boy who's been poisoned. So he always liked to do pictures of real patients, but sometimes he couldn't get a real patient, and he would ask us kids to pose for him, and he would take our picture. Okay, now look sick, and I would go, yeah. and he would take my picture. <laughs> and then he would sketch from that, you know, and uh, stick out your tongue. Or your... So, this little boy um, has been poisoned and he made this sketch and um, then he would take the sketch and he would tape it down with masking tape to the illustration board. It was about this big, bigger than the books, or half again as big as, the, as, the, as it would be reproduced. And then um, he would tape that down and then he would go over the lines 
And you could see here, like around the mouth, around the ear, he would go over these lines and, and transfer that to the illustration board. He'd have a piece of graphite paper underneath, and that would transfer to the illustration board. And then he would paint. And with his merciful brush strokes, he would create the picture. So that's the process that he used. And if you're interested more in the painting, this is a whole chapter in my book about that, how he did it. This is an interesting picture. This, um, he was working with Fred Kaplan, um, the orthopedist at Penn, who was then very uh, young, just starting out. And he um, went down to Florida, to, by then Frank had moved to, to Palm Beach. And um, so they were trying to illustrate uh, uh, osteoporosis. And so they couldn't think how to do that. And so they took a walk on the beach. They took a break from what they were doing. They took a walk on the beach. And maybe they saw some kids playing with sand in the buckets, uh, putting sand in the buckets and dumping it out. And Frank got this idea to make this picture. And it has this little workman at the top there. On the, I'm going to do this thing. These workmen here, the osteoblasts, this is building up the bone. They're putting in big buckets of sand in the reservoir. And just this osteoclast, the, the, the take, little workmen take it away, the, the bone, they're just little buckets and just a few workmen. And that's the building up the bone. And then over here on this side, <coughs> this is, over this side, this could be um, what happens during osteoporosis. That's the, the little bit of deposit of, of, of the osteoclast putting in. And then down here, the osteoclast is taking the bone, bone away, bone away, and that could result in osteoporosis. So that's why that was kind of cute. It explains it very well, I think. Then in 1982, it was a big sensation in Utah when William DeVries implanted an artificial heart in Barney Clark. And that just caused a sensation, the first implantation of an artificial heart. And um, that was in the front page newspaper all over the country. And Frank read that about that. And he just thought, this is a completely new modality. Just so happened, the next month, that Frank was on a panel at a medical convention. And sitting next to him on this panel was William DeVries. And William DeVries was just excited to be sitting next to Frank Netter. And Frank Netter was so interested in the, in the um, artificial heart that they struck up a conversation. and. Um, so Dr. DeVries invited Frank to come to Utah, and Frank said, I, I can do a clinical symposium on this. I have a lot of pull at SEBA, and I'll tell them we're going to do this. And so that's what um, Frank went out there. He met Barney Clark, and he illustrated the, um, the artificial heart. He drew a picture of um, um, Barney Clark and his wife, and she's there standing over his bed, and he has his heart excised, but he's telling her how much he loves her. You know, and it's really, it was really... Uh, quite an experience for him. He just thought this was fantastic that they could do this artificial heart. And then at about the same time, there was National Nurses Week. And Frank, at, under SEBA sponsorship, made this picture for National Nurses Week. And uh, it's, he calls it Giving Life. And it's the hand of the nurse reaching out to the patient. Reminiscent of medicines, like you know, Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel, that picture in the Sistine Chapel. Then, Seaver looked around and said, well, "We have over 4,000 of the Netter illustrations. Do we have enough to make a really first-class anatomy out of us?" So they hired a uh, an anatomist. This gal here is Sharon Cosino. She was teaching at Columbia at the time. And she um, made an album for the book. And then she started going through all the Netter pictures and seeing what they had already and what they needed. And, what, so. and of the 550 pictures that they put in the book, they needed only less than 50. At first she thought they needed only 15, but it turned out to be closer to 50 that he had to make to complete the anatomy atlas. So here he is working just with the last pictures they had. They put them in order and, and 
There's Sharon, and there's, of course, on the right is Frank Netter. And that man standing over is Phil Grushkin. He was the book designer, and he's a book designer. He, he's gone now, but he was a book designer of real note and put the book together like an art book, which, of course, it, it is. And then they took this picture. Here was Frank working on some of the last pictures for the Anatomy Atlas. And there he is in his studio, and that's how he worked. That's how I met him. And this picture has become very, very well known because it was um, in the frontispiece of the first edition of the Atlas, and I think they still put it in the Atlas, which is now going into, uh, in this month, it will be released, it is being released in its sixth edition. The best selling and happy atlas in the world, I believe. So that's my story. And I think there'll be time for some questions here. Thank you, Francine. That's just a fantastic story. I, I love hearing it. Uh, Dr. Trevor, would you like to start with the comments and reactions? Um, uh, just being here is, is uh, it's an incredible for me to be part of this panel and to uh, uh, hear the story about uh, Dr. Netter. Um, I can think of no, I'm not, there's medical students here, I used to learn by something called a textbook, okay? <laughs> so I didn't have a computer to look at, you know, the moment's notice to see, you know, what this, what, what the answer was that I was being asked. I had to actually read about it. And the textbook that I truly felt in medical school that was always on my bedside table and essentially in bed with me was Netter's Atlas of Anatomy. And it was truly the, the, the textbook that I referred to most. And the vivid images really inspired me because anatomy is what I fell in love with when I came to medical school. And I think it really, helped me determine that I wanted a career in surgery. Anatomy is important in any aspect of medicine, but particularly in surgery, it's, it's crucial. And I, I think that my love of anatomy and the time I spent reading this textbook inspired me to enter the world of surgery. Um, the picture of the hand you showed, it's in all my talks uh, that I give to medical students and residents describing the course of the dorsal branch of the radial artery in the, through the anatomic snuff box. I mean, I still use a lot of the images from the atlas, uh, Dr. Natter's atlas, for uh, a lot of the talks I give now. Um, it truly was a, um, a critical for my education. And referring, and re refer to it frequently, even through my residency, I would to make sure I understood the anatomy. Of course, the next step is the surgical approaches. So you have to understand the anatomy before you do the surgical approaches. So I still have it in my office. I have Netter's Atlas uh, as part of my group of textbooks that I refer to. Even now, when I'm doing a surgery that uh, is uncommon, it's always good to have that background uh, of anatomy. The clinical symposia books, I have that clinical symposia of the hand. Uh, it's just absolutely, there's no better uh, atlas for hand surgery than, than, those, than that clinical symposia. Um, I actually got a copy of it. Um, Frank McHugh was my mentor, and he was a hand upper extremity and sports surgeon here. And when he passed away, uh, his wife, Nancy, um, had said he had left a few books for me. Uh, so I went over to his house, and there was some first editions. Sterling Vanell is one of the fathers of hand surgery, and there were these clinical symposia for hand surgery written by Dr. Netter was there. So even he, and he's a giant in my field, uh, he had, he obviously referred to Dr. Netter as well. Um, so Dr. Netter touched uh, many people and, and many medical students and residents, so it's really amazing to hear his story. Um, and then just to say where I am now, uh, 
my department, me and four other faculty members from different specialties, uh, wrote a textbook called the Orthopedic Surgical Approaches. Um, and it's a, um, a textbook divided by, you know, for instance, I, the hand and wrist and the elbow and forearm were the sections I was responsible for. And we worked with a medical illustrationist and we were going through step-by-step -step exposures to the distal radius and so forth. And whenever we would get into a situation, how to best depict, and, and I, you know, we would always refer to Dr. Netter's Atlas and say, look, there's nothing more vivid, there's no better way to depict the anatomy than has been done by Dr. Netter. So it was a resource for us as we put this textbook together to help our surgery residents and, and younger faculty when they're doing surgical approaches. So, so it's an honor to be part of this panel and meet you and to hear his story. Uh, but this was absolutely uh, his his work has, and has was has been and continues to be crucial to education. And and I still we have flashcards which when I'm telling our residents, you know, when you're preparing for the in training exam, know your nerve innervations, know your muscle innervations. There's these netter flashcards. So it's still something that we use um, on a regular basis. Thank you. Uh, yes, I. Uh... And ditto all of the uh, comments about what, uh, what a pleasure it is to learn more about Dr. Netter. And thank you for, for coming and sharing uh, his story with us. Um, you know, from my perspective, I'm going, I'm going to fess up. Um, I never owned a copy of Netter myself until I became a medical educator, until I became an anatomy instructor. And then it became absolutely crucial for me to, to own a copy and use these images. Especially for me, I, my, I spent most of my career teaching head and neck anatomy, and this is one of those areas where it's just really impossible to understand without some, some helpful illustrations to just illustrate concepts in addition to anatomy. So there are exposures that we will never get in the anatomy lab. But all you have to do is, is find what I call netograms, the, the right netogram to, to, to display all of this stuff in a way that makes it so easy to relate the concept. You know, a picture does tell a thousand words in, in these cases. They, they, there's no better way uh, to teach you know, which particular spinal nerve gets hit by a, an interventional disc herniation than to go to the classic uh, net demonstration of that. It will take me hours to try to explain this to a student, but all I have to do now is just say, look at this, see how this works. And there are many, many different images of that, and especially when it comes to the head and neck where you just can't see it all. You can just see little glimpses into the head and neck, but he allowed us to see the whole thing from perspectives that we would never have. Um, I will say that in preparation for today, I, I have stashed the um, eight volume SIBA collection in my office right now. Um, our, our anatomy lab is currently under renovation. And I was just leafing through a number of the of the of the illustrations in the in these volumes, and now I understand why they're there. There are many illustrations of combat wounds in these um, in these volumes that make perfect sense now as to why they would be there. There are images showing how to place a patient a patient in, in when taking a, a radiograph of the chest. All of these images that he did over the years clearly ended up in the very fantastic collection and I just if anybody gets an opportunity to just sit down with that collection it's just it's really entertaining to go through and see all of all of the different images it's not only just illustrating anatomy it's illustrating processes you know cerebrospinal fluid flow uh, procedures surgical procedures uh, medical procedures you know all the various symptoms that a, a patient will will uh, present with with various uh, endocrinology um, uh, uh, diseases, endocrinological, endocrinological problems. Uh, but one question that I did have for you is as I was leafing through, uh, so I think it was the endocrinology metabolism volume, I came upon, I noticed first of all that many, uh, with the exception of the psych, uh, psychiatric patients, all of the patients are stark naked. Stark naked. And so he has one image um, demonstrating uh, giganticism. So he's got an you know, um, uh, endocrinological giant there, completely naked, and it's next to what is called a normal man. And the normal man has got uh, a suit and 
a, a white coat. He's clearly a, a physician. And I'm just wondering, was that Frank Netter in that image? Do you know? It could have been. Mm -hmm. It could have been because he, he used himself mm -hmm. quite often as a, a, mm -hmm. a, as a model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I checked through um, many of the pictures, and it does it does look as if he, it, it was him. I, I wasn't sure, I'm not sure if you were going to show that image, so I didn't want to bring it. Um, also, we also one of my favorites is the um, dermatome map, the Netter dermatome map. Right? We use that extensively throughout teaching anatomy there, and in fact, you might like to know that, that, that on occasion, um, usually, there's usually at a Halloween party, somebody dressed as Dead Netter's Dermatome Man. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't know what that is? I'll, I'll show you, I'll bring you a, a picture of that. But the, the Dermatome Map is, you know, basically all, all lovely colors. As oh, the man dressed with all the different colors where the nerves go? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And there's a face, there's a human face on that. And I was wondering also if that would be Dr. Netter oh, in the face. Yes, it was. <laughs> So yes, I was trying to Google uh, Netter's self-portraits yesterday and trying to find out if those were in fact, and I think it probably was. So I'll, I'll bring those to the reception so you can have a look and confirm for me. But yes, it's, it's one of those things where this is one of those cases where these illustrations are so critical to learning anatomy and teaching anatomy. So it's very, it's very nice to have such a nice collection. I think uh, Melanie makes a point that Sometimes when you were in the anatomy lab and, and doing these cadaver dissections, you were you didn't necessarily learn what you were supposed to learn. Sometimes it just wasn't as clear. Uh, sometimes the conditions of these cadavers were not great. Or um, in particular, I remember in head and neck, uh, you know, that I relied more on netter than I actually, despite the time I spent dissecting the cadaver, I didn't really know what I was looking at to be honest, so I would have to refer to Netter's, and, and I began to understand head and neck anatomy better with that. I, I, and you know, I don't know what it is, but I, there would be certain things, and I just remember page, uh, illustration 427 is in my mind. I think it's the brachial plexus diagram, because I'm a hand and upper extremity surgeon, but I just like, there were page numbers that were just seared in my mind, because I looked at them so many times, and I just knew where to refer to them. Um, but, you know, his influence obviously has carried on. I finished medical school in 1995, so it's, it's, he still, I think, influences me pretty regularly. I refer to his work uh, you know, routinely. I think, is this something? Uh, you know, listening to you, I realized, you know, I know that Frank Nader was a great medical teacher. But he was also probably one of the greatest medical students ever, that he could get this and then translate that into these pictures. So I think we have time for a few from the audience, and I'll take this around. Mm -hmm. Uh, Marcia Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities. This was a wonderful talk and a great story. I have one question for sort of the behind the scenes um, aspect of Netter's work, and that was if he was working in the studio at home a good deal of the time or in an office, I'm curious, he drew from photographs or did he draw from actual anatomical specimens? Um, where did those come from, and what was it like being in the studio with some of the raw material? I don't think he drew. So I, I mean, I never saw a cadaver in a studio. <laughs> I mean, there might be some uh, slides, you know, especially FBI type mm -hmm. slides or something. Um, he would go to the schools, and he would go, he, he haunted the New York Academy of Medicine. He was a fellow of the Academy of Medicine in New York. And um, they have a fantastic library there. And But it was really the uh, the, the people that, he, that Siva would invite to write the text, and then uh, they would teach him what they were doing. And he would go see them often. Often he would um, uh, send back and forth. I think I have a slide I want to show you. 
this I think tells you this is a really good song. Now this is he was working on the um, um, musculoskeletal system, and he was working here on the shoulder. You know these here, and apparently there's a lot of individual variation in here, and, and so you can see he was working with Russell Woodburn in, at Michigan, who's very famous anatomist. And um, you can see here, you can't really read it, but you can see, wait a minute, here's the point. Right here, this, Frank Nero wrote this, that's his signature, right? His initials, he wrote that, with questions about what's, <coughs> he would send this in the mail to uh, Dr. Woodburn, and then Dr. Woodburn would write this reply, and he would write these responses here, and different things. So, yeah. so that's how he would work. Yeah. So a lot of times through the mail, and, and I remember him traveling a lot when he was, uh, when I was a little kid, he would travel a lot. And, so. and obviously doing a lot of preliminary sketches, mm -hmm. which is really. And then he would do the sketches, then he would send it to them, and then they would, you know, comment uh, on if this is correct or not correct. And, and sometimes the picture would reveal that, oh, I see this in a whole new light now, you know, so. Uh, yeah, thank you. I think Dr. Corbett has a question. Yes, Mr. Senator, thank you on the panel for a very wonderful thing. I, I, went, I, I have a similar kind of question. I went to medical school in the 60s, and there were the years when we would be, spend the entire year, five days and sometimes seven days a week in the anatomy lab, and we used Cunningham's textbook uh, to direct us that had the narratives for dissection, and then I was at the University of Chicago, and they insisted that we use Frank Netter's drawings because they, they always claimed they were so accurate. And I'm curious, uh, how did he maintain this accuracy that everybody seems to give him credit for? Did he always have people coming in who were surgeons or pathologists or somebody else to continually validate? Because it's so detailed and, and what seems so detailed uh, accuracy. He must have had... and. I, I was going to ask you, did he spend much time in, in labs rather than his home drawing to get to get that? Well, he, he, as I said, he would he would they would teach him what they were doing, and they would teach it to him, and then um, he would make the pictures, and then he would send them the sketches, and then they would or they would sit down with the sketches. A lot of times they would sit down together and go over. And who are the they that you're talking about? The different uh, consultants that he worked with, like the, the authors of the clinical symposia, for example, and. Um, in, in the green books, the the, the Siebel collection, which is known for mm -hmm. affectionately as the green books, uh, there's text in those uh, in those books, and they describe what the, the the subject matter, and then the picture illustrates the subject matter. So it's text and illustration in the green books. So those authors were teaching him, and so uh, now. For example, when Fred Kaplan worked with him on the um, um, on osteoporosis clinical symposia, he wrote the he wrote the text, and then Frank Nader made the illustrations. Then they would send them back and forth, and then so they make sure the text and the illustrations match, and then it was published as a clinical symposia. But then when when Fred Kaplan was working, he was editor of the um, uh, of the musculoskeletal system, the Green Book volume, mm -hmm. Frank Nenna made the pictures first, and they would lay out the, what was going to what was going to be in the book, and then um, Fred wrote the text to go with the pictures. So to use a modern term, he must have had quite a network. I can't hear you. He had quite a network. He was probably people. the best connected person in medicine. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any more questions? Just one? Not a question, but a comment. And not only did physicians use the net of work, but I'm a professor of nursing, and I had the great pleasure of working on our Old North Two here at University Hospital, which was otolaryngology and ophthalmology. And I slept with those two <laughs> clinical symposia because I taught nursing students there for five years. This was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Thank you.